Wii Sports is the best-selling single-platform video game of all time. Chances are you've played it before. And if you have, you probably think it doesn't lend itself well to speedrunning. Most games have a clear objective, go from start to finish as fast as possible. How do you do that in Wii Sports? I made a video about Wii Sports Resort Golf a while back. Imagine the precision and skill involved with speed golf multiplied by five sports. Here's the story of the gamers who've done it. This is the history of Wii Sports World Records. The biggest speedrun category in Wii Sports is called All Sports. It involves winning a game in each of the five sports consecutively. That means winning a game of tennis, winning a game of baseball, completing 10 frames of bowling, playing 3 holes of golf, and beating a boxer. You have to play them in order, and since there's no other option, you have to use motion controls. Now, Wii Sports came out in 2006, but serious runs didn't get started until close to a decade later. In 2014 and 2015, runs clocking in between 10 and 12 minutes were completed by Plied823, RSR, and Nate9000. But as is so often the case, videos either no longer exist or are in very poor quality. So, we have to go to July 2015 to get our first watchable run. A 945, by the mid-2000s internet culture named Nate9000. There were five sports for Nate to get through. The first one was actually the simplest, tennis. Your opponents are picked based on your skill level. At level 0, you'll get Miu and Matt, who barely know what they're doing out there. You have to get 4 points to win, so Nate tried to just end each rally as quickly as possible. By serving at the very top of your throw, you'll hit the ball harder and make it tougher for the opponent to return it. This has about a 5 frame window, or a sixth of a second. So Nate did that 4 times and hoped his opponent would miss it, which is random. If they returned it, he just hit it across the court to quickly end the rally. It took him only 25 seconds to win the game and exit back to the menu. And that's pretty much all there is to tennis in Wii Sports speedrunning. You can lose a bit of time from returns, but even those only cost a couple of seconds. However, the next sport is way, way more involved than the simple rallies of tennis. It was time for Nate to play some baseball. The most important thing to know here is that if a team's ever up by 5 or more runs after an inning, the game ends right there from the mercy rule. So the idea is that you want to get 5 runs as fast as possible in the top half of the inning, then get 3 outs in the bottom half, and have the game end after just one inning. Hopefully Rob Manfred's not getting any ideas. However, getting an optimal inning of baseball is way easier said than done. When batting, there was no real strategy. Just swing at good pitches and pray you get hits. Nate reached on an error, then lined one to left for a base hit. From there, he was off to the races. A double in the gap, then a bloop to right. Some bad luck for Akira on the mound. But there was nothing lucky about the three-run shot immediately after. That made it 5 runs for Nate, but he still needed to get out twice more to end the inning. 
So, he just struck out twice on purpose. On fastballs that make Barry Zito look like bruised our Gratterall in comparison. For pitching, you obviously want to get three outs without giving up any hits or runs. But there's a lot more to it than that. What you ultimately want to do is turn into Mark Burley. There's a foolish YouTuber who has a video if you want to know more about him, but essentially what it means is you want to induce weak contact for easy outs, and not strike people out. Strikeouts always take at least three pitches, while a ball in play for an out could be done in just one pitch. The problem, of course, is you have little to no control as to whether the batter will swing or not. So you have to make pitches that are good enough to not get barreled, but not so good that they just swing and miss. And of course, get super lucky. Nate wasn't so fortunate. His first batter stared at three straight strikes, and his second one, well, hit it there. His third batter struck out on an Ephus, before he finally got out of the inning on a ground out. Not the ideal baseball split, but there were still three sports to go. Next up was bowling. The strategy here was a bit more straightforward. The more strikes you throw, the better, since strikes only involve throwing the ball once per frame instead of twice. There exist setups to get a strike nearly every time, but they're all pretty slow, so Nate just threw it as fast as he could. He only managed two strikes, before intentionally missing on frame 10 to avoid the third throw. However, his shots were all fast enough that it was still a decent split. Now, it was time for sport number four, golf. There are nine holes playable in Wii Sports, but to count for an all sports run, all you needed to do was the three in beginner mode, or either of the other three hole options. And then, it was time to play some speed golf. You line up for each shot as quickly as you can go, then hit it and hope for the best. There's not much time to think, you just line up and go. There's one key difference between golf in Wii Sports and Wii Sports Resort. In Resort, if you hit an incredible shot, one that either lands near or in the hole from a long distance away, you'll get a replay that loses time. However, that mechanic is not present in the original Wii Sports. So, anything is game. The better shots you can make, the more time you'll save. Nate tried to take advantage of this on hole 1, but his second shot landed over the hole. His first putt was wide left, so he had to take a par. Hole 2 was much of the same, with his initial shot going beyond the hole, then needing two more shots to get it in. And on hole 3, Despite the crowd getting excited, Nate once again was unable to get under par. That made it three pars on three holes from Nate, which doesn't sound great, but keep in mind, he was against the constant pressure of needing to aim each shot as quickly as possible. And finally, the last sport is boxing. You want to ensure your Mii is ranked low to get an easy opponent, like Marco, then just go ham on him until they're down, and hope they stay down. If you punch in a rhythm, aiming for a nice 15 frame window on each punch, you'll be landing critical hits that do more damage. If all goes well, you'll be able to avoid getting punched at all and knock your opponent down quickly. Hopefully they'll stay down and won't get up. It's not known exactly what causes them to stay down, but it seems to be a combination of knocking them down quickly not getting hit yourself, and some luck. And that's exactly what happened to Nate. This was the first ever sub 10 minute run of Wii Sports. There were some highlights, like a very smooth boxing match and the fast start he had to baseball. But of course, the large number of strikeouts and overall slow bowling and golf sections meant there was some big room for improvement. Nate knew this, and just two weeks later, he lowered it another 19 seconds. His golfing was particularly improved in this run, getting three birdies instead of three pars and not missing putts, which made up most of the time save. 
So, 926 was the new time to beat, and it would stand for over two years. It wasn't a particularly optimized record or anything, it was just one of those dry spells that speed games sometimes go through. But in June 2017, the Wii series Discord server was created, which helped spark more popularity in running the game. In August, a player named Mr. Jimmy Steel 25 joined, and within hours, said he had beaten Nate's record with a 916. We'll get to this run in a moment, but there's something else important to discuss. When Jimmy started up his game of baseball, this cutscene played first. Now, most of you who have played Wii Sports before are probably familiar with it, but I guarantee there's a small subset of you who, despite having played the game before, have never seen this cutscene. And there's a reason for that. See, when Wii Sports was released in 2006, it was bundled with every Wii console sold. Europe, Japan, and most other regions of the world had the same version of the game. However, for a few months after its release, the version of Wii Sports that was sold in North America was actually an early version of the game. The community calls it 1.00 and it omits certain features present in 1.01, the version sold everywhere else in the world. The two most important features are both in baseball. First, the cutscene you just saw, which wastes about 5 seconds and can't be skipped, isn't present in 1.00. And second, whenever someone grounds out, an animation plays in 1.01 of them throwing the first which wastes about 0.7 seconds. This animation doesn't play in 1.00. That means that for a typical all sports run, playing on the early version of the game is hugely advantageous, as it'll save you close to 10 seconds over playing on 1.01. Now, when Wii Sports was re-released in North America in July 2007 to promote the new remote jacket, they updated it to 1.01 .01 to match the rest of the world. The cutscene and the animations were added back in. So, this optimal speedrun version of the game can only be found on North American copies made within the first 9 months of its release. Any copy from the next 10 years is of the slower, updated version. That means that even though Wii Sports is one of the best-selling games of all time, this early version is quite rare. It's estimated that only about 1 in every 20 copies of the game is 1.00, or 1 in every 10 North American copies. There's an easy way to check if your copy is 1.00. If it's a North American copy and the title screen says 2006, then it's 1.00. If it says 2006-2007 and the Wii Remote has a jacket on it, then it's not the early version. Since Jimmy was playing on 1.01, .01, he lost some pretty significant time in baseball from version differences alone. However, he had a smart strategy to use while batting. Once he got his 5 runs, instead of striking out on purpose, he bunted for a quick ground out. This took far fewer pitches than strikeouts, but it's tough to perfectly angle your bat to bunt the ball where you want it to go. On the pitching side, Jimmy was nearly perfect. A strike, then a ground out to short, a ground out to first, then a soft comebacker. A four pitch inning. The rest of his run was up and down, getting two strikes in bowling and a birdie in golf. Next up was Nicro, who set a 9.15 just days after Jimmy's 9.16. He has a pretty big internet presence nowadays, but back then he had just a few hundred followers. Now, Nicro's world record run was solid and all, particularly in golf where he got all three birdies. However, the highlight of the run was his batting. He had one run in, but two outs. He still needed four more runs. And with a ground ball hit at the second baseman, it wasn't looking good. 
but then... Oh! Uh... Drop that, yes! Oh my god. Three errors. The odds in that happening were one in a thousand. Nitro's 915 would stand for a few months, before being beaten by Alaska XP2 in January 2018. Alaska had an interesting skill set. He was particularly good at bowling and golf. In bowling, he managed to hit seven strikes without carefully lining up. And in golf, he had more experience than most thanks to his golf runs in Wii Sports and Wii Sports Resort. He managed birdies on holes one and two. And thanks to a beautiful second shot on hole three, he got an eagle there. However, Alaska struggled mightily with boxing, losing nine seconds from mistimed critical hits. Still, it was good enough for a 904. Six months later, Nitro would come back to snag another record, 901. Once again, it was an up and down run. His baseball was quite fast, with five quick runs while batting and no base runners while pitching. However, his one strike in bowling paled in comparison, and let's just say his golf hole one wasn't ideal. The run had good moments, and it had bad moments. We've seen a handful of records at this point, and you can probably tell that this up and down nature was typical for Wii Sports. Outside of tennis, any of the other four sports can cause massive time swings. In baseball, you've got to deal with batting and pitching. Both are extremely random, and can literally cause minutes of time loss. With bowling, a good game versus a bad one costs up to 30 seconds. In golf, each missed shot can cost 10 seconds, and across three holes, that really adds up. And in boxing, missing critical hits can lose a dozen seconds or more. This game wasn't like your traditional speedrun, where you can optimize it and eventually grind down every split. No, the time swings in Wii Sports were different. They were more random, and far harder to control. The record was 901, and with everything listed before going in the right direction, it could potentially go way lower into the 8s or further. But the odds in having all those time swings go your way? It just wasn't realistic. Well, unless Alaska had anything to say about it. In the second half of 2018, Alaska would embark on a push to take the all sports record into the 8 minute range and beyond. He certainly had the credentials to get it there, but the issues of before still remained. Getting all five sports to line up properly was just too difficult. He was going to need some help. And over the next few months, that's exactly what he got. One new strategy he used was expanding the scope of bunting. Players had been bunting for a quick out for months. But if you very carefully angle your Wii Remote slightly more forward, you could potentially bunt for singles as well. The margin between bunting for a hit and bunting for an out was razor thin, but with a lot of practice, you can fairly reliably bunt it to third for a hit. So now, Alaska could theoretically bunt four times to load the bases and score a run, then hit a grand slam, then bunt three more times for outs. It could still go wrong, but there was potential for a really fast batting split. Now for bowling. The days of games with just two or three strikes had to be in the past. Alaska was going to shoot for more like six or seven strikes in a good game. The record at the time, Nitro's 901, had only one strike. Alaska could easily save 20 seconds over that. He was already quite good at bowling strikes, but with more experience, he could save the time more reliably. In golf, Alaska began using an impressive looking strategy to save a few seconds. The driver chip. 
Similar to a trick used in Wii Sports Resort, the flag on the green acts as a wall if your golf ball hits it. If you're able to use a driver and hit your ball into it, it can fall straight down and enter the hole, saving time over having to slowly put it in or get it closer to the hole. Now, the driver chip may seem super precise, but there's actually a setup on hole 2 to get it nearly every time. By hitting your first shot into the bunker, you can then line up with the flag and pull out your driver. By swinging as hard as you can, the game will automatically hook the ball to the right at just the correct angle and speed to hit the flag. And finally, there was boxing. This was the sport that Alaska struggled with the most. There wasn't any particular new strategy he had to use here. He just had to improve at it. Get better at timing the criticals, avoid getting punched himself, and ensure that his opponent had no real chance of getting up. Over time, he did get better, but it was still a battle. With all this, a sub 9 minute run was definitely possible. But was a sub 8 realistic too? It would take a miracle run, but it could be done. Alaska quickly began seeing results. He got an 843 on July 22nd, and then an 830 on August 15th. His bowling and pitching were great, but his batting was far from perfect, and he missed a putt on hole 1. There was still a long way to go. And then came September 29th. After all that, still a record by 4 seconds. What happened? Well, it was the god run up until boxing. His batting was near perfect, with 4 bunt singles, a grand slam, and 3 bunt outs. His pitching was solid, with 2 strikeouts and a 1 pitch out. He hit 4 strikes while bowling, and in golf, got a birdie, a driver chip birdie, and an eagle. It was sub-8 pace, but he just couldn't hit criticals, which led to a slow knockdown and his opponent getting up. But Alaska wasn't done yet. There wasn't much room to improve early on, but he had about half a minute he could save on boxing alone. The sub-8 grind had to continue. He had come close once, he just had to do it again. Let's go! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> yes! <laughs> yeah. Let's go! Oh my god, please! Dude, don't fucking get up. Don't you fucking get it. Oh my god. Yes! Oh my god! Oh my god, I've done it! I've fucking done it! Oh my god, dude! A legendary run. Alaska's sub-8 dream had finally come true. It was beautiful from start to finish. A six pitch inning while pitching, 
six strikes in bowling, three birdies in golf, and finally, a boxing where his opponent stayed down. It all added up to a 754, the first sub-8 in the history of Wii Sports. This run firmly cemented Alaska at the top. Nobody was really close to him. Second place was more than 30 seconds behind. And 754 continued to stay on top. People got a little closer, but there wasn't much new to use. They had to replicate what Alaska did and find somewhere to save time. After 18 months of this, it was clear. There was only one person up to the task of beating Alaska, and that person was Alaska. Yeah! Come on! Let's go! In May 2020, Alaska beat his own record by 8 seconds. Most of the time save came while batting. He avoided a missed bunt that he had in his old record. Other than that, it was nearly identical. A six pitch inning, six strikes, and three birdies. He had found a way to just eke out the time he needed. Many more months passed, and his 746 remained alone at the top. At this point, he had held the record for about two and a half years. That's significant for a popular game like Wii Sports. But by early 2021, he finally had some close competition. Two players had achieved sub-8s of their own. One was Sphere Cube, and the other was Paul in the Mall. Sphere Cube's personal best was 748, just two seconds behind Alaska. But on February 16th, he had a run within striking distance of the record going into golf. And on hole one, he did this. It saved about 6 seconds. Hole 2 had a driver chip, and he finished on hole 3 with an eagle. In all, he saved 15 seconds over Alaska on golf alone. It was enough to edge him out with a 743, making it the first time someone had dethroned Alaska in nearly 3 years. And the best part about it? He did it while playing on 1.01. I mentioned before how much rarer 1.00 is, and despite being a top runner of the game, SphereCube was unable to acquire a copy of it. He lost about 10 seconds in baseball from that, and still was able to beat Alaska. He was pretty good. About a month later, Paul in the Mall was making strides for the record. He got a sub-8, but took a break from running the game around the time SphereCube got the record. He came back a month and a half later, and got a 737, a record by 6 seconds. Paul played on 1.00, so he saved quite a bit of time in baseball over Sphere Cube. But immediately after this record was set, controversy arose. Once you finish hole 3 of golf, the fastest way to move on to boxing is to reset to the menu. For years, the rule was that once the golf ball hit the bottom of the hole, you could perform the reset. However, in July 2020, runner Emoad Nomad hit this unbelievable shot. The ball hit the bottom, so he resets in the menu. However, you can see that when he reset, the ball was in the process of bouncing back up. On chip-ins like this, it's actually possible that the ball hits the bottom, bounces up, and lands outside the hole, meaning you need another shot. So, the community came up with a rule that whenever there was a chip-in, you have to wait until the phrase chip-in appears on the screen to reset. It seemed like a logical rule. However, in Paul's 737, his hole 3 ended like this. He reset right away, but since the ball hit off the pole, it technically would have been a chip-in, and he didn't wait for the text to appear. But then again, 
there wasn't any chance this ball would have bounced out. It rolled in rather than falling in off the polar flag, despite technically being a chip-in. The community was split on how to rule this run, but ultimately it was allowed to stay on the leaderboard. The rule was changed so that as long as the ball rolled in the hole, even if it was a chip-in, you could reset once it hit the bottom. And so, Paul's 737 was the official world record. Just like the dozens of records that came before it, the 737 was great, but in a matter of days, it was going to be obsolete. Because this story is going to take a bit of a turn. Every so often, a speed game gets a new strategy that transforms the run. There's cannonless setup in Mario 64, the scroll glitch in Castlevania, the flagpole glitch setup in Super Mario Bros. When you think of those speedruns, those tricks seem intertwined with them. Up to this point, Wii Sports didn't really have a trick like that. There were unique strategies to use, but no mind-blowing iconic tricks. Well, that was about to change. Because in early 2021, Wii Sports' game-defining trick was going to be discovered. Welcome to the wonderful world of Disconnect Strats. This bizarre-looking trick has a treasured past. For years, players had noticed an odd glitch that sometimes occurred. If your remote disconnected in golf, you could sometimes hit the ball twice but you couldn't hit it far, and it couldn't be easily replicated, so nobody was too interested in it. From 2018 to 2020, this glitch happened to several players, including Simple Strat 17 and even world record holder Alaska XP2, but it remained just a curiosity. In early 2021, Plyde decided to investigate it a bit more, to figure out exactly how it worked and what he found shocked the community. If you hit the ball, then disconnect your remote by taking the batteries out, you can put the batteries back in and swing a second time. The catch is that the sum of these two shots can't add up to more than four bars of hit power, so you can't hit it further than a normal swing. However, if your second shot happens after hitting water, the ball will stop on a dime after a quick transition and you'll be placed wherever it is, including potentially on top of the water. This saves time in a couple of ways. On a hole like hole 5, you're supposed to take a curved path around to the green, but with disconnect strats, you can go straight to the hole across the water and take a more direct path. And second, your ball completely stops once the transition occurs, so if your timing's good, you can hit the ball into the water, quickly hit it a second time, and avoid the time the ball would normally take to stop rolling from even just one shot. The River P, Wipeout Jack, and Nomad found fast routes for the intermediate holes, so that was the new course to use. On hole 5, you can save about 7 seconds by going straight across the water, and on hole 6, you can save about 4 from using the transition to stop right where you want. That meant that, in theory, 11 seconds could be saved. Wii Sports Run suddenly had potential to get quite a bit lower, as not only could extra time be saved, but golf could be more consistent as well. The first player to use disconnect strats in a record was Shockwave TLS, who lowered the time down to 7.35. As you'd expect, he gained time on golf, despite his initial disconnect shot on hole 5 being mistimed. It helped when he hit this shot on hole 4. Hole in one. However, Shockwave is from the UK and he wasn't able to import a copy of 1.00 from overseas, so he lost time in baseball. Next up was Sphere Cube again, who lowered the record 9 days later with a 732. He had switched to 1.00, so he saved the time in baseball. 
but he didn't use disconnect strats. Yeah, especially in the early days of disconnect strats, even some top level runners found it too difficult to go for, since it wasn't technically needed for the record. About a month later, Shockwave took it a couple seconds lower. But still, he was playing on 1.01. A few months after that, Sphere Cube took it back, while still not using disconnect strats. Nobody was willing to string it all together. But in the summer of 2021, Shockwave would finally get a copy of 1.00. A top runner now had all three pieces of the puzzle. 1.00, a willingness to do disconnect strats, and a lot of skill. They all combined for a 728, a new record just one day after Sphere Cube 730. This world record really had a lot going into it. You've got bunting for outs, bunting for hits, aiming for strikes, driver chips, disconnect strats, and much more. Shockwave implemented all of them, and the end result was a 728. Was there any time save left? Well, there were seconds here and there. His batting was near perfect, but while pitching, he accidentally threw an immaculate inning. Three strikeouts, which we know from before are slow. There was room to save about 15 seconds there. His bowling was perfect, nine strikes, so no time to save there. For golf, he missed the putt on hole six, and his boxing could have been a bit better too. So, sub-7 was definitely possible, but the problems of before still remained. It required perfection from all five sports, and that just wasn't realistic. But that didn't mean people couldn't try. By September, another contender showed up to play, Emoad Nomad. And over the next few months, these guys were going to engage in a battle, both against each other and against the sub-7 barrier. Shockwave would strike first, with a massive 7 second cut of the record. He had time to save on pitching and on hole 6, so he gained 12 collective seconds there, but lost a few seconds while batting thanks to a foul ball. A few weeks later, he'd take it down to 718, and Nomad was right behind him with the 721. Nomad would then have a run a few seconds ahead of the record, but needed a miracle shot on hole 4 to keep it going. Back to the drawing board. On October 11th, Shockwave got a 716. Nomad followed up shortly after with a 717, a run that came just 24 hours too late to be a record. On the 15th, Shockwave had a run that lost time early to batting, but had an extraordinarily fast 5-pitch inning to bring it back to even. That showed how much potential there still was to squeeze out of the record. It finished as a world record of 7.15, but could have been several seconds lower had he not been forced to foul off an inside pitch. Okay, so one thing was starting to become clear. This wasn't much of a competition. The battle between Shockwave and Nomad was a blowout. Shockwave had set the past seven records in a row. Nomad hadn't set any. He remained in second place the entire time, sometimes even within a couple seconds of the record, but never overtook him. This was starting to become personal. Nomad had to prove that he was still capable of taking the record. Well, he kept doing attempts. And on October 16th, Nomad was gonna have his chance. He was three seconds ahead of his personal best going into boxing, but he had time to save there. He could theoretically get as low as a 7-10, Five seconds of wiggle room over the record. He just had to lock it down. Yeah. 
Shockwave's record was 7.15.433. Nomad's final time, 7.15.733. He had missed by less than a third of a second. Nomad could keep going. It's not like he was far off from the record. His next personal best would almost certainly be it. And sure enough, the very next day, he got himself a 714. It was a new world record. Had it not been for Shockwave getting this just hours before. An unbelievable record from Shockwave. It had just about everything. Nearly perfect batting, four pitch inning, great disconnect strats. It just missed sub 7 because of a missed shot on hole 4. Nomad kept trying, but at this point, Shockwave was way in the lead. It was going to be really tough, but he wasn't giving up. He kept chipping away at his time, and by November, he had gotten within a stone's throw of the record. A commonly used metric to determine a runner's pace is best possible time. It can be measured from any point in the run. If the runner matched all of their best splits from a certain spot in the run to the end, it measures what time they would get. On November 12th, 2021, Nomad exited baseball at 314. It was one of the fastest paces he had ever been on. And his best possible time from there was 644. This was a golden opportunity. He entered bowling and started throwing strike after strike. Five in a row, then six, seven, eight, and nine. It was a perfect game on one of his best paces ever. He did lose a little time in frame 10 from slow falling pins, but according to his splits, Nomad's best possible time was still 6.48. But one of the biggest run killers was coming up in hole 4. It's hard to get a birdie on this hole, as winds can throw everything off and make life harder. Nomad was going to try to land in the bunker, then driver chip for a birdie. Now more than ever, this had to work. It was beautiful. He didn't get a hole in one, so he couldn't get in the 640s anymore, but his best possible time was still 654. This was doable. Three splits to go. But he had to get through hole five's two disconnect shots. Shot one went well, but on shot two, he landed far from the hole. It was tough, but Nomad had to sink this putt. He had missed enough world records. This shot had to be the difference between all his pass runs and a sub-7. Players like Emoad Nomad are often overlooked in speedrunning. Shockwave is an incredible player, as evidenced by his nearly endless list of world records. But Nomad's skill is right up there with him. People often focus on the world records, but really the path to getting there is what's important. Nomad has had a lot of near misses, but he's going to break through. His sub-7 dream might not be done yet, but the journey it took him to get there is what'll make it feel so great. And really, that's what speedrunning's all about. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, I'd really appreciate you sharing it with a couple other people and hitting the subscribe button. Thank you.